and we're live. Great. Welcome back to Elasma Week, everyone. I've been your host this week, Dr. David Schiffman. Elasma Week is an online outreach event about the science of elasma ranks, which are sharks, skates, and rays, and the scientists who study them. And this week is all about diversity, highlighting the diversity of scientists, the many ways of doing elasma rank research, and to show off as many weird and wonderful species as possible. Elasma Week wants to make a platform where real scientists can share their love and work with the public. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Dr. Catherine McDonald, who is an interdisciplinary marine conservation biologist who studies shark and ray biology, ecology, fisheries, and conservation. Her research interests also include marine ecosystems, human wildlife conflict, and wildlife tourism. She is one of the co-founders and the director of Field School, an interdisciplinary marine science training and education program, and is a lecturer in marine conservation biology at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School for Marine and Atmospheric Science. Take it away, Catherine. Here we go. So uh, my goal today is going to be to talk to you guys a little bit about shark conservation and shark conservation issues in the hopes that uh, we can develop a more holistic understanding of what we're really talking about because in a lot of public discourse about shark conservation, we just say that it's important, but we don't really talk about the whys or hows behind that. Um, also, if you're watching this and you wanna reach out to me with a question, you can see my email is right there on the slide. Please do feel free to reach out. So I'm Dr. Catherine McDonald, uh, and I founded Field School, a marine science training and education company with four of my close friends in 2015. We run field courses that teach students how to do hands-on field work in tropical marine systems, including with uh, coastal sharks and rays. My research with field school uh, focuses on shark biology, ecology, uh, and reproduction uh, with some work on habitat use. I also do a lot of field work in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Southern Caribbean, uh, working with local fisher partners on shark fisheries and conservation issues there. Uh, I got my PhD from the University of Miami's Abbess Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy, and I currently teach at the Rosenstiel School, uh, where I mainly teach master's students. Uh, I have over 13 years of experience working with sharks in the field and uh, teaching in the field in the classroom. So over the course of that time, I've learned a lot, and I'm hopeful that I can share at least a little bit of that with you. Uh, when I started in shark science, I thought that shark conservation was pretty simple and straightforward. If you wanted there to be more sharks, the way to do that was to kill fewer of them, right? Easy. And what I've found over the course of my career is that it's an almost endlessly complicated problem to find effective, fair, uh, intelligent ways to try to reach conservation goals. So we're going to talk a little bit about why conserving sharks is difficult. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about global narratives about shark conservation, what they tell us the problem and potential solutions are, and how those global narratives actually play out on a local level at the study sites where I commonly work. Uh, one of the important insights that I hope that we'll develop over the course of our time together uh, is an answer to the question, is it useful to think about these problems on a global scale when we're trying to solve them? And I don't know that I have a concrete answer yet, um, but I'm hoping that we can work towards a deeper understanding together. So firstly, we need to talk a little bit about the biological and ecological traits that make sharks vulnerable to overfishing and overexploitation. And one of them is a K-selected reproductive strategy. Uh, ecologists really like to use complicated words even for concepts that anybody could understand. So we're gonna unpack this a little bit. Uh, we talk about species as being either K or R selected. K selected species are animals that uh, take a long time to mature, have large bodies, uh, and usually produce fewer, more highly developed offspring. That means because they're investing more in each individual offspring, 
survival of those offspring tends to be higher. Our selected species, like our bony fish here on my right, um, are basically the opposite, right? We produce a large number of offspring. Each of them costs relatively little. We know that most of them won't survive to adulthood, but we're playing a numbers game, hoping that enough do to carry our genes forward. This means that bony fish uh, are able to recover from overfishing in ways that sharks struggle to do. Uh, if you overfish a bony fish, uh, for some species, they can produce 3 million or more eggs per year. Uh, if they've been overfished, but you still have a decent number of females, they can produce a lot of eggs. And those eggs often have higher survival when adult density is reduced, either because they have access to more resources or because they're less likely to be eaten. So um, bony fish, what ecologists like to call teleost fish, can recover generally. Uh, from overfishing much faster. They also reach sexual maturity much more quickly, so that population is able to rebound more rapidly as a general rule. For our case-selected sharks, that's a lot more difficult. Um, because our reproductive output is constrained by the amount of energy it takes to develop those large-bodied, uh, well-developed offspring, and because we're further constrained by the amount of space we actually have within our bodies to carry them, uh, we're not able to increase our reproductive output in response to population declines. And because that juvenile survivorship is already pretty high, uh, it's not going to be as increased by adult overfishing as it would be for an R-selected species. So fundamentally, sharks are more vulnerable uh, to the risks of overfishing because of these life history traits. They're also more vulnerable in part because of their trophic position. And their trophic position in the simplest terms just means where they fall on that food pyramid, right? Most sharks that we see on Shark Week are what we would consider apex predators. They're at the very top. And in ecosystems, generally, uh, only 10 to 15% of energy is conserved at every trophic level as you move up the pyramid. So you start at the bottom with primary producers, if they produce 10,000 units of primary production, only that only supports 1,000 units of consumers, right? The little zooplankton that eat them, which then only supports 100 units of a mesopredatory fish that eats consumers, which then only supports 10 units of a higher level mesopredatory fish that eats that fish, that then only supports one unit of apex predator. This is why when we talk about sharks being a sign of a healthy ecosystem, one of the ways that they are a sign of a healthy ecosystem is that they need so much healthy ecosystem below them in order to be able to meet their own needs. Uh, and so you can also think about my shark migration in those terms, right? Sharks need to traverse a wide area, sometimes getting energy from multiple different pyramids at different depths or in different locations in order for the pyramid below them to be large enough to support their population. This means that naturally uh, they have to be rarer than all of the things below them because otherwise there wouldn't be enough energy in the pyramid below them to support their populations. Uh, we, although we often think of sharks as apex predators, I also want to shout out our mesopredatory shark friends uh, because there are many and they're vitally important to food webs. If you care about apex predatory sharks, you can and should care about mesopredatory sharks because the apex predators wouldn't be there without them. Uh, one of my favorite mesopredators is the black nose shark. And we've got a picture of one right here. He is a full grown adult. He is mature. Uh, often when students first see a black nose, they think it's a baby. Um, but in fact, that's an adult shark because sharks come in a variety of sizes, have a wide range of feeding preferences and needs, um, and many of them do fall into that mesopredatory category. When we talk about sharks' importance to ecosystems, one of the critical things that we're talking about is their role in shaping ecosystem structure. And that sounds kind of confusing, but don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna go through it a little bit more slowly. We remember that pyramid, right? 
So sharks influence everything that's below them through feeding, but also through what we call non-lethal effects. So sharks not only pose a risk of predation for a fish, they might actually eat you, but they also shape your behavior to avoid predation so that you select habitats to feed in or mate in where you think you're at lower risk of encountering a shark and potentially being eaten. So that's what we call top-down control of the structure of an ecosystem. In marine food webs, there's also bottom-up control. And that's that critical idea that we just talked about, that what's at the very bottom of the pyramid shapes what's possible for what's above it. So if you do things that affect marine primary productivity, and we humans have done a lot of things that affect marine primary productivity, you can change the entire food web above it, right? Because if as that the availability of those primary producers varies, who starves and who survives above them will be dramatically affected. We also want to remember that primary productivity on land tends to be very stable. If you think about a forest, it's long lived, it remains pretty much in the same place. And that ecosystem in the absence of disturbance remains pretty stable over time. What we're looking at in this picture here is a plankton bloom from space. And we can see that in marine environments, especially in open ocean environments, uh, food availability can be patchy in both time and space, right? Those plankton blooms can move sometimes tens of kilometers a day, creating oases in the pelagic ocean, but also leaving fish who miss them vulnerable to starvation. The key idea behind a keystone species is that a keystone species is one that disproportionately influences the ecosystem in which it's found. Uh, often they're predators, although not always, um, and not every shark is a keystone species in every habitat. But we do know that there are many examples in which sharks are critical to shaping healthy ocean ecosystems. One of the things that I love as a shark scientist and that makes me excited every morning is that there are so many questions that we still don't have answers to, right? We've talked here about some of what we understand about why sharks are particularly important and particularly vulnerable to overfishing. Um, but we don't really have answers to important questions about where many species mate or give birth or where they spend their early years of life. We don't always understand how they relate to other species, how they find or select for prey, uh, how they use habitat. And then on the human side of it, we often don't know much about the amount of fishing effort or how many sharks are being caught in many parts of the world. Uh, improving all of these kinds of data is really vital for improving our ability to manage ocean ecosystems in ways that will leave us with healthy resilient shark populations. So now that we've talked through some of those key ecological ideas, let's talk about where we're at from a shark fisheries perspective. Globally, shark fisheries are worth about a billion dollars, uh, about $439 million of that is fins, the trade in shark fins, about 380 million of it is the trade in shark meat. Obviously, some of those fins and meat can come from the same sharks, and that's pretty common. Many fished shark stocks around the world have shown significant declines in biomass in recent years. Annual global catch of sharks peaked in 2003, and we believe that those declines in landings has more to do with the absence of healthy shark populations to be fished than it does with demand for shark products because shark meat has emerged as increasingly important in global food security in recent years. About one in four, so about 25% of the shark species we know of, which is about 540, are at elevated risk of extinction according to the best available science on their conservation status. And globally, shark fisheries are very undermanaged. And by that, we mean that there are many shark fisheries in which there aren't restrictions on catch rates or the restrictions on catch rates aren't realistic to what we believe that population can bear, or we don't have the data to estimate what a realistic catch rate would be. 
uh, or often we don't have the ability to enforce a rate even if we were able to set the correct one. It's worth taking a second to note here that I know that we all care about sharks and that people who care about sharks can definitely disagree about whether sharks should be targeted by fisheries at all. But especially in the United States, but broadly globally, the goal of fisheries management is to deliver the maximum sustainable yield. And that is a fancy fisheries term for taking out the most that you can without compromising availability for the future, right? So our specific stated goal when managing a shark fishery is to extract as many sharks as we can for the benefit of people uh, while ensuring that that shark population can remain healthy into the future. You can think about the ways in which calculating that maximum sustainable yield might be a little more difficult for sharks than for other species, right? When you're at the top of that pyramid, you're vulnerable to everything that happens below it. So if you're calculating maximum sustainable yield for sharks, but you don't know much about their prey's population status or their prey's prey's population status, you might get the number wrong. Um, and we know that if you do get the number wrong because of that case selected life history trait, you run the risk that sharks won't be able to recover from that overfishing rapidly. So managing sharks carries extra levels of complication over fisheries management more broadly. Let's talk a little bit about how we understand these threats because now we know more or less what our actual situation is. Let's talk about the way that the situation is reported in the media. This is from a paper that uh, I published this year with uh, David and a great team of scientists, David was our leader, um, looking at media analysis of shark conservation and threats to sharks. And one of the insights that didn't surprise me but made me a little sad was that one of the largest threats represented in the media is shark finning, right? Um, when of course, shark finning even at its worst is a subset of overfishing or unsustainable fishing. Uh, however, it receives disproportionate media attention relative to other threats to sharks like the meat trade or bycatch. One other insight that I found interesting was the weight that was placed on negative public perceptions of sharks as a potential threat to sharks. Because while I think we can all agree that sharks don't have the best PR, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, I also am not sure that that directly threatens their survival in the way that overfishing or unsustainable fishing or uh, the trade in shark meat or fins does. Another insight from that paper, whose citation is right there, if you are curious and want to read it, please do, uh, was that overall, the shark species that are being reported on in the media are not the same as the shark species that are most threatened with extinction. Uh, and overall, the sharks that are getting the most media attention are often the same sorts of sharks that we see repeatedly featured on uh, in the media in like Shark Week, right? They're the species that we find charismatic. They're often larger bodied species. Um, and they're the ones that we tend to think are coolest. And I'm guilty here too, hammerheads are one of my favorites. Uh, but it does mean that we're not directing people's attention to the most serious, most risky conservation problems that are currently occurring. Coming back to that media bad PR challenge, right? We have the Jaws effect, which is this idea that Jaws really reset human cultural relationships with sharks and is sort of the framework for how we understand and think about sharks today. Uh, there's also the mean world syndrome, which is an idea that holds, basically, if you watch a lot of crime shows on TV, you're more likely to think that it's, there's a serious risk that you'll be a victim of a crime because you see them all the time. Uh, the mean world syndrome can also be applied to things like Shark Week over-reporting on shark attacks uh, and media coverage of those events increases people's perception that that is a meaningful risk to their safety. And of course, sharks have always had PR, bad PR. The picture here on the right is from a South African newspaper in the 1950s. And you can see that they've added some extra teeth for him there because he didn't look quite fearsome enough by himself. All of this 
has led to a perceived need among conservationists for us to try to change people's knowledge of and attitudes about sharks. And we're gonna talk next a little bit about why that's difficult and how we can potentially be a little bit better at it. Discourse has also increasingly posed this question. Are we the monsters or is it sharks? And um, while I appreciate the effort to make sharks seem better, I think that I would prefer that we move away from characterizing any one or thing as monstrous in this setting. So this brings us to the knowledge deficit model, right? And the knowledge deficit model is basically an idea in science communication that holds that the problem is a lack of knowledge. That if we told people more about something, that would change how they felt about it in the way that we want it to and how they acted on it in the way that we also want it to. And we're gonna stop here for a brief moment to talk about this. Firstly, it's really important that I tell you that there's a large amount of scientific literature showing that the knowledge gap does not work. Giving people more information about something does not make them care about it more if they didn't care about it before. Uh, it, it just isn't effective and we know that and we have known that for quite a while. Uh, but secondarily, I wanna kind of pose this to you in a way that I think helped me to grasp it more intuitively. Uh, so David, I'm gonna call on you for a second. Here. You're just gonna show up hands with me. Okay. Do you believe in human caused climate change, that the climate is changing and that we are the reason? Do you hold strong pro-environmental values? Do you care a lot about the environment and its future? And then finally, do you own a car? Do you fly on planes? Not this year, but yes. Do you eat meat? There is a, a frequent disconnect between our values and the things we do. We all know that a healthy diet includes more kale than it does cake, but most of us are more eager to eat cake, right? We make choices based on a variety of factors. They are not made strictly rationally. So even if I could convince somebody of the facts, right? Even if I, as an excited, eager shark scientist, was able to have a captive person and who did not like sharks and got to just talk to them about shark facts all day long. And I was like, did you know how long Greenland sharks could live? Did you know that the frilled shark has an insanely long gestation period? At the end of that, I probably wouldn't have changed how they felt about sharks. So this kind of points to one of the key problems with how a lot of conservation messaging is handled, right? Because we think that raising awareness in and of itself is a meaningful conservation benefit. But raising awareness where it doesn't lead to concrete action and where we've established strongly that it doesn't lead to changes in attitudes or belief, even where it leads to changes in knowledge, uh, isn't in and of itself necessarily all that beneficial to sharks. So we wanna make sure that we're thinking about how to focus our efforts in shark conservation in the ways that will best serve uh, the animals themselves. So from here, we're gonna talk about the biggest identified global problem for sharks that we've seen, which is shark finning, right? It's not the biggest problem necessarily that our survey of information about shark conservation gave us, but it is the one that's most reported on. So it's the one we should expect the public to know the most about and understand the best. Shark finning, very simply, is the process of cutting off a shark's fins and then discarding the rest of the shark at sea. Uh, this is a very sad and potentially wasteful process, uh, but we wanna keep in mind that a shark can be harvested without being finned, right? Here in the United States, it has been illegal to fin sharks since 2000. Um, it is legal to harvest sharks under our fisheries management regulations within certain limits. 
So if you harvest a shark, you are required to land that animal to bring it back to shore with its fins naturally attached, which basically just means you cannot take them off at sea, right? You have to land that shark whole. And at that point, you can sell its meat and its fins to various people, depending on what they're being sold for. People often think that there is no distinction between shark fishing and shark finning, and that therefore all shark fishing is extremely wasteful and environmentally destructive. Uh, many, many sharks whose fins wind up in the global fin trade are consumed often by communities that rely on them for food security. This doesn't mean that shark populations can sustain levels of take that they've been experiencing in recent years, but it does mean that we want to be sure that we are distinguishing between these things and that we have clarity on what we're actually talking about when we try to adjust rules or regulations. I often see uh, petitions going around to ban shark finning in the United States. Shark finning in the United States has been banned since 2000. Um, let's focus our shark conservation efforts on the things that actually pose meaningful risks to sharks. One of the distinctions that we need to make is between the process of shark finning, taking the fin off at sea, and shark fin trade, which is the sale of those fins from any source, right? Shark fins can come into the trade from legal well-managed fisheries. Shark fins can come into the trade from illegal harvest. The shark fin trade globally is a trade that centers around Hong Kong and China and draws shark fins from around the world. I have often had students explain the problem to me as China's demand for shark fins. But of course, uh, a globalized trade requires people willing to sell as well as people willing to buy. In 2008, the US was the seventh largest global exporter of shark fins in the world. And many other nations export shark fins as well. The problem here is that we're very eager to try to place blame in a specific location, especially if it's far away from us, right? Then we can say shark conservation is a huge problem. Finning is a huge problem, but I don't have anything to do with it. Figuring out where to place blame or responsibility for these kinds of things is difficult. And it's one of the reasons that I feel like placing blame isn't necessarily the most useful way to think about these things. Is a fisher who's just trying to make a living and feed his family to blame for shark global shark declines? What about businesses that trade in shark fins? Many businesses have multiple revenue streams. If their trade is legal, should they, is it morally wrong for them to trade legally in a product that they're allowed to trade in? For consumers, is buying something without thinking deeply about its environmental effects blameworthy? Because I know that for us here in the US, many of us purchase products without thinking deeply about the ways that they affect the global environment. We all feel bad and think that it's wrong that the Amazon is deforested or that orangutan habitat is being cleared for palm oil plantations. But we all also like inexpensive beef and access to cookies made with palm oil. Those, those changes in the global environment aren't happening independent of us. We aren't uninvolved. So often this kind of blame placing involves trying to displace responsibility onto others in ways that doesn't ask us to change our behavior or make any sacrifices to try to better conserve the global environment. And we talked about this a little when we talked about climate change, but it's really difficult for individuals to take action within a system that's not designed to help them. So if an individual fisher heard me out about shark conservation and, and shark population declines and was worried about it and decided he was going to stop catching sharks, that may or may not actually help sharks, right? Because maybe he stops fishing, but the guy the next, uh, you know, the next house down doubles up on sharks because there are more available. It's really difficult to, to try to solve 
large systemic problems through individual action. Uh, and one of the things that we need as a species to get better at is coming together to try to act collectively to solve some of these problems without trying to point the finger at other people uh, for problems that we ourselves play an important role in. So we have a brief overview of global shark finning and the shark fin trade. How does that fit in at either of my study sites? The media has told us this is the single biggest conservation threat to sharks. Well, here in Miami, we're an important global transshipment point for shark fins. They often pass through our port, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. We had a major seizure just last year, um, a seizure of, of contraband shark fins. But if you asked most people in Miami what their relationship to shark finning is, the answer would be, I don't have one. So if you present shark finning as the most significant global problem to sharks, you are also indirectly telling people here in Miami that they don't have a role to play in solving it, right? Because they see themselves as uninvolved in it. In St. Vincent, shark fisheries play an important role in food security and lots of people uh, rely on and eat shark, but they are not part of global trade in shark fins. Uh, in general, shark fins there are either discarded or used in lobster traps as bait. Uh, they are not entering into that global market. Uh, and St. Vincent passed a law banning shark finning preemptively uh, just last year. So both of these places have meaningful conservation problems that affect sharks. Here in Miami, we have significant water quality problems that make important habitat for sharks less and less hospitable. In St. Vincent, the trade in shark meat, even though it's mostly non-target, uh, potentially poses risks to local populations. Those are conservation threats that we should care about. But when the global conversation about shark conservation is framed around finning, it leaves out a lot of other potential threats and a lot of other potential actions we could take to improve things for sharks. Let's talk now about one of the most popular proposed solutions to shark conservation problems, shark tourism. This one has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Scientists have increasingly proposed shark tourism as a tool for conserving sharks in ways that are also economically efficient for local communities. We've also seen this idea picked up by the media and by NGOs. Basically, uh, in a lot of cases, we're trying to value shark's contribution to tourism uh, and then say, okay, they're worth more alive than dead, right? Their contribution to local tourism generates more dollars over their lifetime than they do in fisheries. This sounds like a potential win-win, right? More total economic revenue generated uh, and healthier shark populations. One of the most important problems with that idea is that there are about 20 species of shark for which there's a significant global demand for tourism. And that demand, as you'll imagine, is focused overwhelmingly around relatively warm, clear water uh, that's relatively close to shore. So with over 540 species of shark, the vast majority of species are not realistically going to benefit from a conservation perspective from demand for shark tourism. There's some other challenges too, which we're gonna talk about now. So one of the key ideas behind shark tourism is that it is a non-consumptive use of sharks. And I find that terminology potentially a little bit misleading, right? A consumptive use of a shark would be catching it and eating it. A non-consumptive use, uh, suggests that it's the opposite of consuming it, right? And the opposite of catching it and consuming it would be not affecting it at all. But there's strong evidence that we'll talk about next slide that tourism with sharks can have significant effects on the animals who are engaged in it. So it would probably be more accurate to talk about consumptive and less consumptive 
rather than non-consumptive because we don't want to erase the fact that even as it may be better for shark populations than direct fishing pressure, it doesn't mean it doesn't have potentially negative effects. Uh, there's this key argument over whether shark tourism represents a break with the past, right? We're reimagining our relationship to wildlife or whether it's just a new version of fishing, right? Where we're finding the economic value in our wildlife and then using it in the way that we feel best benefits humans. So it doesn't represent a change in values, it just represents a change in the particular use that we're engaged in at this time. One of my biggest concerns about using tourism to drive conservation is that makes it vulnerable to demand for tourism. So right now we're all stuck at home in a global pandemic. Lots of shark tourism sites have not been seeing heavy tourist traffic for eight months, nine months at this point. That means that if you're making a strictly economic argument for conserving sharks based on their tourism value, at some point, it may make more economic sense to use them in fisheries in the absence of potential tourism revenue. Uh, this is at the heart of one of the things that I believe about conservation, which is that when we make those arguments strictly economic and not about ecological health or even what's important to us, uh, we cheapen them in some way. Talk a little bit about the impacts that tourism can have on wildlife. We know from a variety of sources uh, across a wide range of vertebrate animals that encountering tourists can be a stressful experience for wildlife. Many shark tourism sites provision sharks, which means that they feed them. Uh, in order to attract them in for close viewing. That comes with its own set of dangers, right? Uh, the sharks can be fed food that's inappropriate for them. They can uh, injure themselves competing for that food. They can become dependent on food handouts. They can get a little bit too comfortable coming close to boats. And we know that at shark tourism sites, uh, sharks can be se severely injured by encounters with boat propellers that they approach in an effort to get a shot at that delicious, delicious fish. Uh, competition for that bait can also lead to aggression between sharks that can result potentially in injury in at least some species. We also know from other studies that a range of physiology, uh, a range of an animal's physiology can be altered by the tourism experience. That uh, heart rate can increase in response to human presence, that many, many species release stress hormones uh, to manage their response to human presence, uh, that increased densities of animals at tourism sites can lead to the spread of diseases or parasites, um, and that animals that participate in tourism can show poorer body condition than animals that don't. Uh, at least in dolphins, we know that reproductive success can also be influenced by participation in tourism. One of the things that's really tricky, uh, especially with sharks, we think back to all of those data gaps, right? A lot of the time we can note a change in shark behavior in response to tourism, but it's difficult for us to answer the question of, so what, what does that mean, right? If I do a study and I say, well, my shark, my shark population has changed its habitat use by about 10% in response to my new tourism site. Okay, so? And a lot of times those data gaps mean that we don't really know how to interpret some of those changes. We don't necessarily, we're not necessarily able to say whether they're significant from a conservation perspective or not. Um, we don't necessarily have to answer those questions to try to manage wildlife tourism in ways that minimizes potential negative impacts on animals who are participating. Um, but we do want to recognize that even where we can't necessarily identify all of those impacts or quantify them or explain what they mean, we still want to recognize that they likely exist and that 
we're not choosing between fisheries and not having an impact. Uh, we're just choosing between an impact that we're pretty good at measuring, you know, number of total sharks, and an impact that we're not very good at measuring, which is the ways in which um, wildlife tourism can shape natural behavior. The big arguments in favor of tourism, in addition to the economic arguments, are mostly social, right? That tourists learn from these experiences, that they can change their attitudes, that uh, shark tourism will overcome people's fears of sharks and change their minds about them. There is some limited evidence that personal experience can alter knowledge and attitudes, especially where tourism operators are trying to optimize for those things, which in some cases they are, and in some they probably aren't. There is very, very limited evidence that participation in tourism alters people's behavior. And my personal feeling from a conservation perspective is that I don't highly care about people's knowledge and attitudes if that knowledge and attitudes does not translate to pro-conservation action, right? because sharks aren't staying up at night thinking about what people think about them. Uh, the thing that we need to do differently is to do things differently, not necessarily just to think things differently. And here I would come to this key point that as a general rule, tourism is not an altruistic act. You don't go shark diving because you are so worried about sharks. If you're that worried about sharks, you probably would donate that money to a conservation organization. Um, here I would plug Shark Advocates International as a great place to send your pro shark donation. Um, tourism is something that you do because you want to, and there isn't ne necessarily anything wrong with that, but I do think that there's a fundamental problem with framing consumption as an act of conservation, because it generally isn't. In the same way that like, if you need a new t-shirt, Sure, it's great for you to buy a new sustainable t-shirt that supports an environmental cause as opposed to just any old t-shirt. But if you don't need a new t-shirt, it's probably better for, you the, for the environment for you not to buy anything. Uh, the other argument about tourism is that it creates incentives for locals to tolerate the close proximity of wildlife, right? Uh, that even if you don't really like having sharks in nearby waters, if they're generating jobs and revenue, you will have more patience for it than you would otherwise. One of the key problems with this argument that kind of goes back to the economic argument a little bit is that when you talk about sharks being worth more alive than dead, we have to also ask the question of worth more to who? Because overwhelmingly, fishermen who rely on sharks uh, are fishing them in part for subsistence as food for their families or their communities. When you decline to allow them to fish to protect those sharks for tourism, the people who are most likely to benefit economically from tourism are not necessarily the same people. Uh, so if you think about how to run a tourism operation, if you wanna be successful, you need to have a crew who speaks good English, uh, who can answer at least some basic questions about sharks. Uh, you need to have a boat that Western tourists are going to be comfortable getting on that's equipped with safety equipment that will make them feel confident. Uh, you need a variety of resources and equipment that you can't have unless you already had some resources. So in a lot of cases around the globe, tourism has tourism revenue has mainly been captured by the elite members of a community or by people coming in from outside and setting up ecotourism operations. So you need to think not only about total economic production, but also specifically about how that money is distributed and to who, and who bears the costs of that redistribution. Uh, otherwise, you end up sort of choosing economic winners and losers within communities in a way that means that fishers don't necessarily have a lot of reason to want to respect uh, fishing limits that you've put in place to protect tourism. And finally, you have the risk of competing imperatives, especially anywhere with a history of shark attacks uh, where beach tourism is an important economic driver. 
uh, beach tourism and shark tourism will at least some of the time be seen as indirect opposition to each other. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So how do these ideas apply at my two study sites? We've, we've heard that shark tourism can be a central component of global shark conservation strategies. How does that work where we are? In St. Vincent, uh, the government is trying to develop an increasingly tourism-based economy. But St. Vincent is currently a bit difficult to get to and a bit difficult to travel within because it's extremely mountainous thanks to the volcano. Uh, so at the moment, uh, there isn't a lot of tourist infrastructure there, and it would be difficult to develop a mass shark tourism opportunity there because they're struggling to draw tourists there even for beach tourism, which is one of the major uh, tourist draws in the Caribbean. Here in Miami, uh, shark feeding tourism is actually illegal. Uh, we don't allow it because of the perceived risk to beach tourism. Uh, we're concerned about the perception that our beaches might be unsafe, and we're secondarily concerned about the potential for uh, cities or the state to be liable for somebody's injury if they were bitten and they had not been warned that there were shark tourism feeds going on. There is unquestionably demand for shark tourism here, uh, but any shark tourism taking place in Florida by law has to be uh, outside of state waters. So that's three miles offshore here in South Florida into federal waters in order for them to be legally able to feed sharks. So in both of these places, shark tourism has a very limited ability to drive demand for shark conservation. If there's one key insight uh, that I've learned in my 13 years working with sharks. It's that there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't an easy solution that just gets it done. Problem solved. I would remind you that even as our worries are occurring at a global scale, conservation action always takes place at a local scale. Decisions about harvesting this particular shark happen in a particular place and come from a particular person. So talking about global trends can be helpful in understanding the big picture, but in terms of giving us tools to solve problems, often it's going to lack the nuance and the recognition of local context that's vital for actually solving those problems. And in this, we can see that these dominant global narratives that we've talked about, about shark conservation, may not capture the reality of what's happening on the ground when it comes to making decisions about conserving sharks. Finally, I always recommend being a little bit suspicious anytime somebody offers you a win-win solution that doesn't seem like it costs anything. The fundamental idea of conservation is to use less now so that there's more later. If somebody tells you we don't have to use less now and we'll still have more later, it's probably because we're making someone else use less now, right? So you don't want to accept that and not think about who's bearing the costs. You wanna be very conscious about the trade-offs that are being made and try to make sure that they're made in the best, most equitable way possible. I think that we can all agree that the poorest people who depend the most on sharks for food security are not the people who should bear the costs of shark conservation. Finally, shark conservation really does start at home with each of us. Right? It's easy for us to look at the world and to say, we should sh solve shark conservation out there. And I know what we should do. We should ban the trade in shark fins. We should tell other countries how they should regulate shark fisheries. But of course, we create a variety of shark conservation problems for the sharks that are closest to us. So the question shouldn't just be, what could be changed? But what can you change? Right? We talked about how it doesn't really help to change knowledge or attitudes if it doesn't change behavior. Some days, conservation feels hopeless to me, and I feel like everything that I've ever done hasn't made any difference. And on those days, if I take a bucket and I go down to the beach and I clean up all the trash I can find, 
I feel better because doing something is still something, even when it doesn't solve the whole problem. If all of us tackled the local problems that we could actually do something to change, I think that we would make a huge difference. Secondarily, please, as much as you can, start from the premise that there isn't a bad guy and that you're not the good guy, right? We're solving these problems together or not at all. So we should all be on the same team. People who are doing things that you wish they wouldn't do probably have reasons for doing them. And if you don't ask about what those reasons are, you don't actually understand what's happening very well. So ask yourself questions like, what happens locally where I live that threatens sharks? And what could I do to mitigate those threats? And you might be thinking, well, Catherine, I live in Illinois, so not a whole lot. And I get to say back to you, well, listen, Illinois, there are things that happen right there in Illinois that absolutely matter to sharks. Choices about the use of fertilizers, choices about allowing trash to wash into streams and rivers and eventually the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico uh, really do make a difference. And so each and every one of us can do things in our community that improve the quality of the environment that sharks live in. We remember how big that pyramid is, right? And how many other species sharks rely on. Uh, the things that protect healthy marine ecosystems at the end of the day protect sharks. Uh, and I know that that's not as easy or tidy an answer as stop shark finning. Um, but I also think it has the benefit of being more true. And finally, conservation is not a job for one person. Uh, I think all of us go into fields like shark conservation wanting to help and wanting to make a difference. But every time in my own career that I've felt like the work that I did really mattered and really changed things, it was because I was part of a team and we were all working together to find the solutions that would work best. So I really encourage you to find your people too, to band together with them and to figure out how that could allow you to make a difference. Here in Miami, the biggest difference we could make is pushing for reform of uh, our sewer system and our septic tank systems. Uh, a lot of people are still on septic tanks that leak and that has been really detrimental to the water quality here in Biscayne Bay. And as somebody who has caught newborn sharks in Biscayne Bay, I know very well that that water quality is threatening the future of sharks in South Florida. Uh, in St. Vincent in general, protecting in environmental health and quality and making sure that we can answer questions about what shark species are being caught in those fisheries and how many is the first step to figuring out how to make sure that those catches are sustainable and that there'll be healthy shark populations into the future. So find a team that you love working with and work with people that you believe in to make changes that will make the world better. I am really grateful to all of you who've made it this far and really grateful to have you as part of the shark conservation team. Great, thanks for that awesome talk, Catherine. Uh, we are going to wrap it up here, everyone, and I'll remind you that there is a live Q&A with many of the LASMA Week speakers happening uh, and another uh, YouTube video in the same Miss LASMA channel right now. Uh, so check that out and you'll see us